Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in, uh, in this beautiful city and with you. Um, I wanted to talk about not really driverless cars, but driverless cities. So our cities are becoming more and more intelligent. We've layered our cities with different type of technologies, so we can really understand in real time what happens in them. In them. I decided to, show, to start with one project because of what will happen in Brazil over in a few weeks about, with the World Cup. To show you, this was, a, it's an old project we did in 2006 during the World Cup for the first time, actually looking at what happens in the city in real time, monitoring billion and billion of data points coming from the cell phone network. Uh, this is actually day of the final in the city of Rome. Italy actually won that day. You see it's before the match. People moving in the city and going here and there, you know, making call. That's early afternoon. And then, uh, Afternoon, and then the match begins. Silence, nobody talks anymore. France scores, Italy scores. Half time, people make a call and go to the bathroom. And then the second half, first overtime, second overtime, Zidane, the headbutt, some of you might recall in a second, and then Italy wins. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that night, actually, everybody went to celebrate. You see a big peak there that's in the city center. The following morning, again, everybody went to meet the prime minister, at the time Prodi, and the winning team in the city center. And by the end of the day, everybody went down there to a place called Circo Massimo, where since Roman times, people go and celebrate. So you see a big peak over there. So this is about you know, how today we can actually understand the city in real time with the amount of information we didn't have before. And well, what can we do with this information? You know, this information is about cell phones, it's about taxis. This is actually Lisbon using GPS information from taxis. And when we have this information, we can then process it and analyze it. So again, this is taxis in your cities. You see pickups and drop-offs all across Manhattan and Queens. And uh, then you can ask yourself, well, you know, what if people could share a taxi? Now, you might not want to share a taxi, but you could. People have proposed, been proposing this for a few decades, but only when you have information in real time in your pockets is become feasible. It can be about sharing a taxi or sharing a car or sharing some other mode of transportation. You don't need to do it, but it becomes feasible. It's a possibility. So we ask ourselves, well, can we quantify that? And you need to develop new mathematics in order to analyze it. If you use traditional linear programming, it fails because the amount of data you have. That's if you want, it's about big data in cities. Um, and, but what you find is quite impressive. You analyze it that basically you could actually run the city of New York if people wanted to share transportation with more or less half of the cars you have today. And you would still take everybody to their destination exactly when they need to be there. So uh, that's the first point. It's about our cities are becoming more intelligent. We have a lot of information about our cities. And through this, we can actually you know, develop new services, understand them better, plan the infrastructure better. The other thing that's happening is actually that the same is happening inside the car. Our cars are also being transformed from kind of the metal elements that Henry Ford was familiar with into something you could call most like computer on wheels. And we know everything of what's happening inside the car. We can actually add sensors inside the car. In this project, for instance, we, together with Volkswagen, we're looking at a lot of sensors inside the car to better understand the driver and the frustration of the driver. Drive. It was incredibly stressful. It was the most stressful drive I've ever been on. Nevertheless, I think we have a lot of great content to measure road frustration because I'm certainly frustrated at this point. This wasn't planned. Oh my God. Okay. Stop the car. So we were just sideswiped. Um, and right now my stress level should be through the roof. Um, we got the information. 
you know, we'll have to process the data and, and see where it's really at. In other terms, um, our cities are becoming more and more intelligent. We know everything about our cities in real time, big data in cities. Then our cars are becoming more and more intelligent. We know a lot about what happens in there. In the outer intersection, these two things, something that you're quite familiar with is about to happen, is happening, which is self-driving cars. Here is what a self-driving car sees of the city, has information from the car collected about the city, information coming from the city. Now, we are not interested in the car itself that much. You know, we don't know if it will look like this, as Google presented just a few days ago. Um, I hope not. Um, but, uh, you know, but the point is not the vehicle. The point is actually something else, is that when you got a self-driving car, then you can have, the car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to your office, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or anybody else in the city. So if you combine this with what we said before, before we saw ride sharing, so if you could share a ride, and if you can share a car, it will not be idle in a parking lot, but actually be used by several people, well, theoretically, you could run a city such as Manhattan, a city such as New York, by removing from the streets four cars out of five. And you still take everybody to destination when they need to be there. And we think that's, uh, you know, that's uh, really imagine what is going to change in terms of the parking lots we need to build today and actually parking infrastructure we, that we will not need anymore. Think about you know, all of how we can really use spare capacity on the system in a much better way through uh, real-time information and sharing and, uh, and technology. Now, the other thing is that if you think about then, in a few, a few years from now, you can think about also uh, traffic uh, intersections. Intersections becoming different, something like this. Don't try it yet. Uh, but you know, that tells you about how you could have the different intelligent intersection. This would be later, it would be probably 2000 and 2040 or 50 when every car will be self-driving. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at that, it's quite interesting because uh, then the capacity of the road can become much higher. What you see here is a, the difference between a normal in intersection and actually intersection where you use a slotting system similar to the one we just saw before. So you actually access the intersection in a dynamic way and look at the difference in terms of capacity and in terms of delays that you introduce on, uh, on the system. In other terms, I would argue that uh, in a certain sense, what we can do today is really try to solve the problems of the city, not by building more roads, not by using asphalt, but instead by using the infrastructure we have in a better way. In a certain sense, less asphalt and more silicon. And we silicon, uh, yeah, anyway, more silicon in terms of digital intelligence. I said it the other day here in Brazil, and I say more silicon, and actually it was translated in the wrong way as uh, silicona, so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, just to wrap up, all of this is to show you about how this technology is entering our streets, is uh, making our cities, the mobility in our cities, different because of sharing, because of real-time information. In the last few seconds, I wanted to share with you how the same autonomy also enters other spaces. It's a project we're doing on the MIT campus. The MIT campus is very messy. Uh, you know, people tend to get lost. There's buildings with different names, with different numbers. Uh, it's very, you know, different place, difficult place to navigate. So we decided to do the following project in order to help people who tend to get lost, and in particular, Harvard students.
Welcome to MIT. Where would you like to go? Follow me, please. The largest research lab at MIT. To your right, the media lab. To your left, the status center. Follow me, please. Approaching. Welcome to Sensible City Lab. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.